Good morning and welcome. We're glad that you've chosen to join us here at our Grace Baptist Church virtual live stream. Let's all sing Dwelling in Beulah Land. Go ahead and turn your TV sets up and sing your praises to the Lord as loud as you can. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Dwelling in Beulah Land. We're going to work on our memory verse at this time. I'm going to have them put that up on the screen for you. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Say it with me. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 1 one through two. All right, we want to welcome you to Grace Baptist Church this morning. It is indeed our privilege to be live streaming uh, direct to you in your homes and uh, wherever you may be today. And uh, this is our fifth Sunday that we have had to live stream from a relatively empty church building. Uh, but I hope that you have um, joined us on Facebook, joined us on our website and uh, are able to see the live stream here today and worship with us together, as well as hear the Word of God preached uh, as well. So thank you for being with us. Uh, we appreciate each one of you that have done this. If you are on Facebook, make sure that uh, you check in on Facebook. Let us know who's there, and uh, that helps us to, to know who we're reaching, as well as um, use those emojis, if you would, please, and uh, give, us, give us a uh, smiley face or whatever if you're laughing with us today. Uh, or not. I hope that uh, today uh, you can worship the Lord in your heart, uh, even though you're not here with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you're joining us for the first time from um, a virtual, in a virtual way uh, here at Grace Baptist Church, we want to welcome you visitors as well into our service uh, today. And so let's ask God's blessing upon our time together here as we worship him. Father in heaven, we thank you for this ability that we have to be able to live stream this service even though we can't meet together. And Father, I pray for each one today that you would keep them healthy. I pray, Lord, you would keep them safe even though they may have to go to work, even though they may have very difficult things to do each day. Lord, some are tired of being at home, frankly. And uh, Lord, I pray for them. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with our uh, folks that maybe um, can't get out. And um, 
They have been cooped up for many, many days now. And so, Lord, I pray you just help us to keep our minds stayed upon you. And, Lord, I pray very earnestly that uh, very soon that this virus, this pandemic, uh, would uh, run its course. Lord, that people would be able to be back together. We don't want to endanger anybody whatsoever. We don't want to see them ill uh, whatsoever. Many, many have lost family and friends and uh, due to this pandemic. And so, Father, I pray your mercy would be upon us. We pray for our country, Lord, as we go through these difficult and trying times. Father, be with those who are in um, elected office, uh, whether that be on the local level, the state level, the federal level. Father, be with our um, representatives and our senators. Be with our president and his team as they deal with this uh, pandemic as well. And so, Lord, may we lift each other up before you. We pray for Tammy Lehman today as she continues to recover uh, from cancer surgery. We also pray for Linda Brown as she recovers from her back surgery. And Lord, we want to pray uh, that you would be with each one, Lord, that um, of our missionaries that, that uh, are dealing with this as well. I do think of the Freeze family today as they have had to come home for emergency surgery on their son, Kai. And so, Father, be with these requests, I pray. Be with our missionaries. Help each one, I pray, uh, to be able to operate, to be able to um, do what they need to do. And, uh, Lord, we pray for churches all across America right now who are dealing with this and preaching the gospel. Lord, may we be able to reach out into the and to the homes and the hearts of those that maybe wouldn't even be at a church. But, Lord, they're searching for answers. And if there's one here today, Lord, that is uh, tuned in to this live stream that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Father, today I pray that they would understand what it means to be truly saved, to know for sure they have a home in heaven, and, Lord, that you're their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I hope you didn't fall asleep there in uh, your easy chair. I know some of you uh, have your favorite chair picked out. It's going to be hard to come back to a pew. I know one day, all right? Uh, so you'll have to bring your pillows or something with you. I'm not for sure. Um, we may have quarantine day here at church, um, and you can come in your pajamas and just feel comfortable or something. I don't know. Um, I just, it gets sillier as we go, folks. Anyways, let me make just a few announcements. If I may, please, uh, concerning uh, several things that I think you would want to know. First of all, uh, there was a Kids Connection at 9.30 this morning. If you missed that, I believe it will be archived. Right, Pastor Halleck? Yes. It will be archived for your young person. Uh, it's kind of a Sunday school, children's church, all in one. Pastor Eddie has put something together with a craft, in, in fact. And so if you miss that at 9.30, it will be archived on the YouTube uh, channel or you can hit that from the website by just going to the live stream link and clicking that. It'll take you to archives as well. Also, we are doing several different um, live stream and Zoom events. Don't forget that on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we are live streaming our prayer meeting with um, all the prayer requests, of course, and the prayer prompter, as well as uh, the Bible study elective class that we have going on um, our biblical walk in our Christian life right now. We'll be starting a new lesson this coming Wednesday, so I hope that you'll join us for that as well. Um, also, there is a Zoom young people's meeting on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock that Pastor Eddie needs your email if uh, you are to be invited to that, and also a Zoom Reformers Unanimous meeting on Friday nights at 7 o'clock that Pastor Beeson would need your email in order to invite you to that Zoom meeting as well. And so don't forget about those opportunities for young people, for our Reformers Unanimous ministry, and of course on Wednesday night as well. Now, we do send emails out at least twice a week, one before the Wednesday night service and one on Saturday, uh, concerning our live streaming and any announcements that we have. If you are not getting those emails and you would like to get those emails, make sure that you call the church office this week. We will put your email in our database, and you will get an email concerning those things um, as well. It is a very good way to keep up on what is going on uh, at church and how we um, uh, are planning for the future. Also, continue to pray for the prayer requests that I mentioned here today. Pray for Tammy Lehman. She is recovering from mouth surgery, uh, removing cancer from uh, her tongue and there uh, under her tongue. Pray for her as she recovers. Pray that she'd be able to swallow and eat solid food. Also pray for Linda Brown, who had back surgery in Florida. And I mentioned our missionaries, Mike Freeze, Mike and Michelle Freeze, their, their son Kai had to come home to the United States uh, in order to have emergency surgery. And so you pray for him as well. Let me just say that um, according to the governor on Friday, 
Uh, he extended the um, stay-at-home order from April 20th, which would be tomorrow, all the way through May 1st now. So another couple of weeks um, in quarantine, a hunker-down type of a situation. And then we don't know exactly what shape uh, that will take uh, place at, on May 1st. We believe that we're going into phase one, which is still just 10 or fewer people in any given venue. And so we do not plan on opening um, the church building back up really for the remainder of May, and we'll keep you posted for that. But we're in our fifth week here, and there's uh, four or five weeks, four or five Sundays in May. Uh, so uh, we don't know if we're going to be going um, eight, nine, ten weeks on live streaming. And I realize that uh, with the live streaming comes technical difficulties. Uh, the past couple of live streams, we've had, a, we've had a good deal of technical difficulties, but stay with us. Don't leave us. Don't get frustrated. I know many of you are frustrated because the sound has been messed up or you didn't see the music or whatever, but be assured that we are archiving these as well and that you can see them un uninterrupted okay, on the uh, YouTube archive. Uh, there as well if you miss anything. And so don't become frustrated with the technical difficulties. We're praying that God gives us an unimpeded service even here today as well. And once again, our staff is calling through the church roll. Some of you have said, well, I haven't gotten a phone call from anybody at the church. Uh, make sure that we have your proper phone number, number one. Make sure also that your voicemail is not full uh, on your cell phone, especially, and that your voicemail is set up because many of our phone calls go directly to voicemail and sometimes there is no more room on your voicemail or the voicemail is not set up and so you would be missing those phone calls as well. But we do wanna make sure that you're okay and uh, we want to be able to do anything that you need. Uh, if you need a grocery run, a pharmacy run, um, whatever it may be, we can try to help you in whatever way uh, that is. So just give the church a call, if you will, please. All right, we're going to go into our offering time here. We're going to have some special music I think you're going to appreciate. Um, while they're coming, um, I heard about a group of retirees that were going to um, Florida for the uh, summer as uh, we have a lot of folks in Florida as well. And these retirees were flying on an airplane, and they became very afraid when the pilot came over the intercom and said, folks, we have some bad news for you. Two of our engines are on fire. Uh, we are flying in fog, and we have hardly any visibility. And uh, things are going wrong uh, moment by moment. And uh, we, we just need you to understand that this is going on. And, and uh, the passengers, of course, were numb with fear as they began to think about all the ramifications of the engines being on fire and flying in fog and things like this. And um, they were all uh, getting anxious until one man who was a semi-retired preacher, there's a lot of semi-retired preachers in Florida, semi-retired preacher says, now folks, calm down. Let's just pray about this. Bow our heads and let's pray. And uh, everybody bowed their head and began praying, except for a man all the way in the back of the airplane. And the preacher looked at him and said, Sir, why aren't you praying with us? Why aren't you bowing your head and, and, and praying? And the man said, Well, I'm not too religious. He goes, uh, and I don't know much about prayer. And the preacher looked back at him and said, well, well, try to do something religious at least. And the man grabbed a hat and began to pass it through the plane. So... Um, he was, uh, you can laugh about that, you know, I'm not getting a lot of feedback in here, uh, but we are going to pass the hat, and I do thank God for uh, the faithfulness of God's people through this quarantine time. Um, offerings have been uh, good to fair, and I've been really, really appreciative of that. Thank you so much for remembering um, to send in uh, a tithe through the mail, to bring it in. People have been doing that. Or there's online giving, and you can see that on your screen there as well. There's two ways to give online, through the website or through texting as well. And so we're going to pass the hat. We'll have a word of prayer and some special music at this time. Father, thank you. you to make us faithful to you until, um, Lord, we can get back and, and worship in this manner with giving our tithes, giving our offerings in a public manner that is um, a representation of our heart's worship to you. And so, Father, bless each, each one that gives today. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you very much for that offertory. Uh, Naomi and Ben Angelo, appreciate that. Uh, Naomi Jones and Ben Angelo, clarification there. Thank you for that. Uh, let's uh, sing again. We'll uh, turn in our hymnals if you have one to 476. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Who can cheer a heart like Jesus by his presence all divine? All that thrills my soul. Lord, I see love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see Thank you for singing with us. At this time, we'll have a special in song by Mrs. Kathy Jackson.
Thank you, Kathy, for that. I know that was a real blessing to those uh, that are at home during this time. I hope that you can say it's well with your soul. You know, if you're a Christian today, it should be well with your soul. It should be. Uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, um, let me just say that it can be well with your soul. Where would your soul spend eternity if you were to die today? Because we were made to live forever somewhere. And um, I hope that you know where you would go if you were to die today. But um, thank you, Kathy, once again for that. I know folks really enjoyed that. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5. We are going to be continuing through the next fruit of the Spirit here. I believe this, while you're turning to Galatians chapter 5, I believe that Christians should be able to see the difference between the works of the flesh, which are in Galatians 5, and the fruit of the Spirit more plainly in the world today than ever before. I believe that Christians are going to be marked by the fruit of the Spirit as we see the days in which we live become more evil and evil every single day. And so um, we should be marked by the differences, the contrasting evidences um, between the works of the flesh that are listed here in Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit, which are also listed here as well. We're going to continue this. This is the fifth fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to read here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit, here it is, the, the um, outgrowth of the Spirit in our life, because we're saved individuals, should be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and then it comes to the fifth one, gentleness. Gentleness. Now, this word is also translated as kindness. Kindness. And we're going to look at that in God's Word in just a little bit here. This word gentleness is um, used in ten different um, times in the New Testament, Ten different times in the Greek language. And this is the only place, though, where it was translated gentleness. It's translated gentleness only here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Now, in other places, uh, the other nine times that the word is mentioned in the New Testament, it's translated as good, same Greek word, uh, one time. Goodness, it's translated four times. We're going to look at that as well. And it's also translated kindness, kindness. Um, four other times in uh, the New Testament as well. So uh, this is where we get the idea of being gentle from. And really this word has at its root uh, the idea of being useful, the idea of being profitable, the idea of being able to be employed in something that is advantageous. It means that we are to be able to manifest this fruit in our life, to seek to apply it in our day-to-day -day lives as kindness, that it is useful in others' lives. It's a characteristic that others can be uh, looking at our lives and seeing in us. I want to ask you the question before we begin, can other people, can your spouse, can your children, your friends and family, your co-workers, can they see that you are a kind individual? Usually, we give ourselves a lot of latitude in this area, and we say, well, I think generally I'm a kind person. I'm a gentle person. Well, we're going to look in God's Word here today and really see what the basis for gentleness is. We're also going to see where we may uh, be lacking in this area as well, because this is, a, is, a, is something, I think, as a fruit of the Spirit that is really lacking in our, in our Christian lives today. When people look at us, do they see us as kind, because this is a highly sought after, a highly profitable, a highly useful fruit to cultivate and to continue to let God use in our lives to, to make an impact on other people. When I talk about being employed, 
once again, that's a sense of what this root word means of gentleness, kindness. It means that you can, uh, you, you have a useful attribute. You have something that is profitable, something that can be employed to somebody else's advantage. And I want you to know this, that this is a Christian's employment, to be kind. A Christian ought to be engaged every day. They ought to consider it their job to be kind. Wow. Are you considering it your job to be kind during this quarantine period? I mean, people are being thrown together. Uh, families are more together than they ever have been. There are some pros. Uh, there are some advantages of this quarantine, I think, in some people's lives because their families have never spent this much time together uh, in a long, long time. And so spouses are having to relearn each other's names and, and uh, favorite things. Uh, kids um, are, you know, getting on your nerves and you're having to relearn maybe how to parent a little bit. Um, but can you say that during this quarantine time that you have been employed in kindness? You may not be going to your job, but it is your job to be kind. Uh, you, may, um, uh, you may not consider it to be something that is an employment, uh, but it is something that we need to be engaged in every single day because that is what this word really means at its, at its heart. And so I need to ask myself, am I being gentle? Am I being kind in my relationships with other people? Because this is where it, the rubber really meets the road is with relationships, gentleness, kindness, being able to uh, have this as something that is profitable and employable on a day-to-day -day basis in my life. Christians, sometimes I think they think that they have an excuse to not be gentle, to not be kind. Uh, they think that they uh, can just say whatever's on their mind anymore, uh, whether that be on social media or whether it be uh, just talking to people. Sometimes I scratch my head and I'm like, why, why do people think that they can just say whatever they want to say if they're a Christian? They can't do that. It's like the story of a minister who at Christmas time received a fruitcake from one of the well-meaning ladies in the church. We've all received those kind of fruitcakes before and different, maybe not a fruitcake, but gifts and things like that that really just, um, they, they uh, were more of a problem than a blessing maybe, okay? And so this family, they sit down. It's like, okay, the pastor brings home this fruitcake. It's Christmas time. And he's like, so-and-so made this at the church, and, and, you know, we're very grateful for it, and so let's, let's try to eat this. Well, the family sat down. They tried to eat it, but it was so dry. It was so tasteless that they could not eat the fruitcake, and regrettably they had to throw it away. Well, when the lady asked him about it at church, how he liked the fruitcake, he said, well, ma'am, let me just tell you this. He said, let me assure you that a fruitcake like that never stays long around our house, okay? It never stays long around our house. And uh, that was the truth, and he was trying to be kind as well. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of thing I think sometimes where uh, that's a lost art sometimes today, all right? To be kind, to speak the truth, and yet be kind, all right? Um, I think sometimes... Uh, that when we're not kind, we don't understand how useless and harsh and severe we are with other people, and we exclude this fruit from our life, and we're not constantly being employed in gentleness. We're not constantly being employed in exemplifying kindness. But I see here in God's Word three different aspects that I want you to notice here as we are employed in kindness, employed in kindness. Turn over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, we're going to be flipping around in the Word of God just a little bit here today. Romans chapter 2 in your Bibles, Romans chapter 2. Once again, this word translated gentleness is also translated as good, goodness, and kindness. Good one time, goodness four times, and kindness four more times. And only here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, is it translated as gentleness, which is definitely in keeping with the idea and the intent of the word. But it's very interesting to note that in several places in the New Testament, it's used in, in the fact that God is kind, that God is gentle, that God is good. And one of those places is here in Romans chapter 2. And I want to begin reading in verse 1. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, 
thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or, verse 4, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now, what is Paul talking about here to the believers that are in Rome? He is explaining chapter 1. Chapter 1 is uh, basically a description of the unsaved world and their decline into debauchery, their decline into a life without God. And he begins in chapter 2 and verse 1 saying, hey, if you are engaged in these kind of things, there is no excuse for these things. And in fact, if, you're, if you think that you're not engaged in these things and you are judging those people that are doing these things that I've just talked about in chapter 1 and you're doing the same, let me tell you what you're doing. He says in verse 4, you are despising the riches of his goodness. Same Greek word that's used in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. You're despising the riches of his goodness. And the Bible says it two times there in verse 4. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I want you to see, first of all, that the primary basis of gentleness is God's example of how he is kind, of how he is good, of how he is gentle to us. First of all, God's gentleness leads us to a saving repentance. God's gentleness leads us to a saving repentance. Paul here is telling these Gentile believers that are in Rome that they shouldn't be engaged in judging somebody and doing the same things that they judge somebody else for. Now, Rome was the center of the world at that time. Rome would have been populated with all kinds of different people, and Christianity had just come to Rome. Now, they were going to be under intense persecution, but at this time, when Paul is writing this, he is saying and telling them how the world is living without God, and the things that they were engaged in doing, and all these different sins that he lists in, in Romans chapter 1, and then he says, you know what? Don't judge unless you're not doing those things, because many of them were doing those same things. And he says, you know what? You're forgetting something. You're forgetting. And that word forget means to think against, to disesteem. So in fact, they were thinking against God's word in this manner because they were judging people and doing the same things at the same time. And he says, you know what you do when that, that happens? You are forgetting and you're judging against people and you are forgetting the goodness of God, that God's kindness allows us to come to a saving repentance, which is a change of mind, a change of mind. Aren't you glad that when we do sin, that God just doesn't strike us dead, that, that God doesn't send a lightning bolt, that God just doesn't make it be your last breath at that moment? that God is kind, that God is good, that God is gentle. That's the word in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. That God is employed in kindness to us, and that kindness leads us to repentance. Sometimes we believe that we can get away with sin and get away with sin and get away with sin, and God doesn't see it, and God doesn't, it doesn't matter to God. Folks, that's not the truth. The truth is, is that God is being good to you. The truth is that God is being good to me. And that goodness should lead us to a change of mind about our sin. If you're a Christian today, and uh, you know what's right and wrong, just like the Roman church did here in Romans chapter 2, Paul says they're inexcusable because they, are, they know what's wrong, and yet they're doing the same thing and still judging people. Hey, folks, you know what? If you're engaged in something like that and you're a Christian, you need to realize that God's not winking at your sin. God's not overlooking your sin. God is giving you time to repent of your sin. And if you're not a Christian today, you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive you for your sins. You've never repented of your sins. That means to have a change of mind about your sin and to turn in a 180 degree direction from your sin and back toward God and say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I see my sin as you see sin. 
God is holy. He can't tolerate just one sin. And if we have ever sinned just one time, we do not have a home in heaven. You're not going to heaven because you're trying to be good. You can't get to heaven by trying to be good. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, verse 9 says, lest any man should boast. No one's going to be in heaven because of what they did. No one's going to be asking anybody in heaven, hey, what'd you do to get here? What'd you do to get here? There isn't going to be any of that. It's all going to be because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, because he was righteous. And because he is righteous, I can accept him as my Savior, what he did for me on the cross. And God says, I will give you Christ's righteousness. And when God looks at the saved person, he doesn't see your sin any longer. He sees Christ's righteousness applied to, imputed to your account. And that's the only way you can get to heaven. And if you have been living a life full of sin, you need to repent of that. Uh, you, need to, you need to ask Christ to forgive you for that. The guilt will be gone. The burden of your sin will be gone. You don't have to wonder where you're going to spend eternity. God's goodness leads men to repentance, the Bible says here. It gives us a saving repentance. Once again, the goodness of God. And you know what? It doesn't just say that it's the goodness. It, sells, it says the riches of his goodness. There is a wealth of goodness. In fact, God lavishes his goodness upon us so that it gives us time to think about things in a really serious way, in a spiritual way, so that we can repent of our sins. And in that way, God is showing us that he is giving us a second chance, and he gives us a third chance, and so on, and so on. That's the goodness of God. He is gentle. He is kind. This is the quality of God that is trying to lead to an about face in my life, trying to lead to an about face in your life. That's what repentance is. To turn our back on our sin and turn toward God. God's goodness does that. Instead of my complacency, instead of my self-sufficiency, God's goodness and gentleness and kindness leads us to that. He's trying to get our attention by being kind. He is constantly employed in being kind. The primary basis for gentleness in my life, in everybody's life, is how God has given to us his goodness and allowing us time to come to repentance. And so when I look at God's gentleness, I ought to be implementing that in my life. Because God has given me kindness and exhibited that to me and to you, then I ought to be able to be willing to give that to other people as well. It's, a, it's the basis, the primary basis for gentleness. His gentleness leads us to a saving repentance, but also I see that God's gentleness leaves us with a serious reminder. Look over in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22. In context here, Paul is giving a doctrinal lesson on why he has set Israel aside at this time and has grafted in the Gentiles. And out of Jew and Gentile, he has made one church. And in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, the Bible says, behold, therefore the goodness, same Greek word, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Now, what's he saying here? This is the classic passage on the Jewish people being cut off because they rejected their Messiah. Uh, when Jesus Christ, a few weeks ago, I, pre I uh, preached on the fact of Jesus coming into Jerusalem uh, on Palm Sunday. And then last week was Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday as well. Uh, when Jesus presented himself as king to the Jewish people, they rejected him. In fact, they crucified him. They killed him in a horrible and cruel manner. And so they were cut off. That's the severity that Paul is talking about there in Romans chapter 11. And then he says to you, to you Gentiles who have been grafted in, he's giving a picture of somebody who is um, 
very um, um, well versed in uh, how to work with trees. Okay? And maybe you have an orchard and you know what I'm talking about here, but you can cut off a branch and you can actually put a branch of another tree onto that tree and graft it on, or you do this with plants sometimes as well, where you graft something on and there's a way that you can do that um, and it's a skillful way that you do that. Well, the Gentiles were grafted in because the Jewish people rejected their Messiah. The Gentiles have now been grafted in and we have been shown the goodness of God in three different times in this one verse. He uses this word goodness. Goodness. It's gentleness. It's kindness. But what he's telling them here, he's leaving them with a serious reminder here, is that God is saying that unless you continue in obedience, you're not going to be able to experience the goodness of God. God was very long-suffering, the Bible says, with the Jewish people. Okay? Until the moment they cut off the Messiah. They crucified him. And so the Jewish people were cut off. Now, God is going to deal with the Jewish people once again during the tribulation period, okay? But right now, it's the Gentiles have been grafted in, and Jew and Gentile make up the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. And he says here very plainly in verse 22, listen, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. He says there's two different examples here. On them which fell, that's the Jewish people, severity. They were treated very harshly, okay? But toward thee, you Gentile believers that now make up the church, goodness. And he says, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. You say, Pastor Rory, I thought you said God was good. He is good, okay? I thought you said God was kind. He is kind. But he is giving us a serious reminder here concerning our own behavior and not taking God's goodness for granted, not taking that kindness that God has employed in every single day for granted because we decide that we're going to go against his goodness. You don't like it when people take advantage of you. You don't like it when your children uh, disobey and they disobey and they disobey and they take advantage of your goodness and your kindness. And at some point, you're going to cut them off. At some point, you're going to yank them back. Okay? That is exactly what God is saying here, too. It's not that a Christian uh, merits the favor of God through faith and good works. It's not talking about that. We don't merit anything from God through faith or good works. Okay? We place our faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. We don't add good works to that. But what he is saying is that their obedience, their obedience is a prerequisite condition on which the favor of God is continued. Say, Pastor Ray, I don't, I don't believe that. Folks, that's what Paul is saying here. Don't take God's goodness for granted. This is a serious reminder that he gives to the church. Okay? The grace of God is magnified in this way through his kindness when we are obedient because he is good to us. And so God is spoken of as gentle here. The primary basis for our goodness, our kindness, is seen in God's goodness and gentleness to us as well. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, because now I want you to see the possible barriers to gentleness. The possible barriers to gentleness. Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17 in your Bibles. The Bible says this, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And he says that ye put off concerning the former conversation, that's your lifestyle, the old man, that's our sin nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. 
Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that means to build people up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And listen, be ye kind. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We know this passage. In fact, I just preached on this passage on Wednesday, talking about uh, sanctification, that we are to put off the old man, the sin nature. We are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and put on the new man, which is created in true righteousness and holiness, the Bible says. We are to be different as Christians. And yet Ephesians 4, 32 says, and be ye kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I see in this chapter the possible barriers that we have to overcome in order to be gentle. Galatians chapter 5 is a chapter of stark contrasts. And we see that also here in Ephesians chapter 4. Because here you have the works of the flesh which are manifest, and they're spelled out. And you also have, in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, but a lot of these same things are mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 as well. Okay. Here we are to contrast and not be entangled with the works of the flesh, but rather cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, which includes this gentleness, this aspect of kindness in our life. And in Ephesians chapter 4, in the passage I just read, we see how uh, we're to also be kind one to another, but I do see these barriers here, barriers that we've got to overcome if we're going to live and be employed in kindness every single day. And I want you to see, first of all, that the opposite of gentleness is corrupt communication. The opposite of gentleness is corrupt communication. Do you remember what I told you, the root word or the Greek word that we have here of gentleness and kindness and goodness is? Who remembers? You guys remember? Raise your hand if you do. You remember? Okay. I see those hands. All right. So if you remember that it means profitable to be able to be employed, it means that you are useful that's the root of that Greek word. Then the opposite of that is here in Ephesians chapter 4, where it says in verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Okay. Whereas gentleness is useful. Gentleness has a moral excellence about it. And because it's useful, it's advantageous to others. And so it's therefore kind. It's a useful fruit. An employable trait, well, the word here in Ephesians 4.29 that is translated corrupt is literally the exact opposite of gentleness. It means that it's worthless. It means that it's rotten. It means that it's decayed. We ought not let any kind of rotten, worthless, decaying words, communication, come out of our mouth. This is a possible barrier in your life to being gentle and kind and good to people. You need to look at your own words that are coming out of your mouth. There are no redeeming qualities whatsoever, Paul says, about this kind of corrupt communication. It's the exact opposite of gentleness. And so if we say unkind things to people, have you ever caught yourself saying something unkind? You said, man, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, why did I say that? Do you find that happening a lot? Where unkind, non-profitable, um, unprofitable, not morally excellent, but corrupt, worthless, rotten words are coming out of your mouth rather than kindness and gentleness, something that's useful or excellent? Do you ever wonder why you sound so unkind sometimes? Well, this could be a possible barrier to gentleness, to kindness in your life. 
If we're to be employed in giving kindness out every single day, no matter what your job may be, we're to be kind. You say, Pastor Roy, you don't understand my, my boss. It's very hard to be kind to him. Pastor Roy, you don't understand the people that I got to work with. You don't understand my spouse. It's hard for me to be kind uh, to those people. I find myself being very unkind. Well, folks, the Bible says that corrupt communication is worthless. It's rotten. No redeeming qualities whatsoever. And when we allow this worthless communication to come out of our mouths that tears people down, that's not profitable by any means. Do you see yourself producing kindness? Or do you see yourself producing this rotten fruit of corrupt communication? The possible barriers are corrupt communication, but I also see another obstacle to gentleness is caustic communication. Caustic. We know what this means. It means acidic. Okay? It means, it means uh, something that will rot you away, something that will dissolve. Because the Bible says here in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Here's that caustic communication that Paul is talking about here. He spells out the barriers to gentleness or to kindness in our life. And you may have erected these things in your life. Um, and, and it keeps you from being kind to people. Bitterness. This Greek word means poison. Are you a bitter individual? Bitterness that causes people to not even want to be around you? Who wants to be around a bitter person? And you say, well, I try to be kind, but people, people uh, keep me from being kind. And people have made me bitter. No, you've allowed yourself to become bitter. Bitterness is caustic. It's poisonous. And they poison everything around them with their attitude and actions. And their words. Paul says another word here, wrath. Wrath and then anger. He uses both of these words, two different Greek words. You can look at wrath as the beginning of anger. And then the Greek word for anger means the passion of wrath that's brought to its climax. When you blow your top with uncontrolled, passionate anger. That's a barrier, a definite barrier to gentleness and kindness. If you're an angry person, a wrathful person, you allow yourself to become angered and frustrated. He says another word here, clamor. This word clamor is yelling and hooting and hollering and a tumult. Not gentle at all. It doesn't describe gentleness whatsoever. These are caustic Caustic type words, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. And then he uses a word called evil speaking, evil speaking. This word is the uh, Greek word that we get our English word blasphemy from. It means to injure people or to tear them down with your hurtful words. Never being kind, always trying to put somebody else down. Now we understand what blasphemy means, but blasphemy is bringing God down to our level. Okay, or speaking in a, in a critical, um, harsh tone concerning God. We do the same thing to people, and we hurt them, and we injure them with our words. Evil speaking. And then he says, with all malice. This word just means evil, and, and, and it incorporates all these caustic, bitter, angry words because they, they produce this malice. This malice is... Uh, a settled, sullen outlook that drives one to look for opportunities to revenge itself by the destruction of the object of its indignation. Okay? A sullen, settled outlook that drives the individual to look for opportunities for revenge by the destruction of the object of its indignation. That's what malice is. It's evilness. It's badness that poses an obstacle to any who are wanting to cultivate gentleness or kindness in their life. Folks, these are the possible barriers. You've got to look at your life and say, are any of these barriers in my life? How about the corrupt communication? Okay. The wicked, rotten, uh, just useless, corrupt communication that proceeds out of our mouth. How about these caustic things that he enumerates here in, in verse uh, 31? But I want you to see thirdly, We've not just seen the possible barriers and also God's example of kindness, but now we come to the proper behavior of gentleness. 
The proper behavior of gentleness is found here in Ephesians 4 and verse 32, and it says, and be ye kind one to another. That's where gentleness comes in, kind. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So what does gentleness look like? What is kindness? Okay. Well, the Bible gives us two different things here that I think we need to understand. First of all, gentleness will be courteous. Gentleness will be courteous. Courteous. And be kind one to another. Another place where this word is used in, is in Colossians chapter 3. It's a few pages over in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, where Paul writes this. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, if you're a Christian, put these things on, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, here it is, kindness. Same Greek word, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Okay. Kindness. An aspect of this, the behavior, how it presents itself to people, is in this aspect of courteousness. Okay. Courteous behavior. Being polite to people. Okay. Remember that the root word of gentleness and kindness here and goodness means to be useful, employable, profitable. And Christianity does not produce crabby people. Okay? Christianity does not produce sour people. If you have a, a disposition that is bitter, okay, I use the word crabby because I think we understand that, okay? Sour. If you have that kind of disposition, you need to take a hard look at yourself. Okay, do you understand that God has been good to you and allowed you time to repent? Do you understand that God speaks about the opposite of gentleness with these uh, corrupt communication type of words and caustic communication type of feelings and attitudes and words that we have? God has said, don't let that be a part of your life. And now he says, you need to be kind. This, this word has something to do with being courteous here as well. Polite to people. Okay. It doesn't encourage Christians to violate the proper rules of social contact. You know, sometimes I think we say more on social media because we're behind the computer screen than we would ever say to somebody's face. And if you would not say it directly to their face, which it might be wrong to say it anyways, directly to their face, why would we say it behind their back? Why would we say it on a social media platform? I see so many mean and unkind and uncourteous things being said on Facebook, and Christians need to check themselves. They really do. Am I being courteous? Am I being polite? Because Christianity produces that in our lives. And I'm not talking about a fake politeness. I'm not talking about being hollow here, but a politeness that is based on genuine kindness, wanting to impact somebody's life in a gentle, good, and kind way, wanting to uplift them and be kind one to another. Paul tells us again in verse 12 that we ought to put on kindness, okay? Put on kindness because these things are useful and profitable. But I see lastly that gentleness will also produce compassion. Gentleness will be compassionate. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, he uses the same language that he does in Ephesians 4:32. He says forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, if any man is arguing against you, has an offense against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye so also do ye. Wow. Almost exactly what he says in Ephesians 4. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That word forbearing means to hold yourselves back from one another, to endure it, and forgiveness, forgiving one another. This word and the word in Ephesians chapter 4 are, um, it's a Greek word that's not the most commonly used Greek word for forgiveness. It's a special Greek word, okay, less used than in other places, okay. But this word has the same, I found it very interesting, it has the same Greek root as gentleness and kindness does, okay. 
Gentleness never puts anybody in needless pain. Okay. We've seen what the opposite of that is. It's malice. We've seen what the opposite of that is. It's harshness, fighting back, arguing, anger, telling people off. That's not being gentle. That's not being kind and good. And Christians are to be employed in kindness every single day. How good a worker are you at that? Are you engaged in this moral excellence and this usefulness, this profitableness of kindness? We don't put people in pain on purpose. Okay. That's not compassion. In fact, we would want to deliver people from their pain. You don't know what kind of a day somebody's been having. Why would you come in and wreck their day? Why would you add uh, to their burden? Why would you add to their pain? You have no idea what kind of week somebody is having. We've got to be very careful with our words and be employed in kindness and not harshness. But we also, there's another aspect of this, is that that's forgiveness. Because forgiveness is compassionate. Forgiveness is being gentle. Holding a grudge is not being gentle. Being angry at somebody, being mad at somebody, and staying mad at them and not talking to them, that's not kind. God calls us to compassionate forgiveness. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Once again in Colossians chapter 3, we're told to forgive one another and forbear one another. Wow. Are you... A forgiving person? Do you show compassion by forgiving those people? Well, the Bible says that if we don't forgive, we need to take into account the truth that Christ has forgiven us. And so there should be nothing that I am not willing to forgive in the life of somebody else. People come to me all the time, maybe in marital counseling or something like that, and they're like, I'm done. I, I, I can't forgive them anymore. I'm, I'm like, wait a second, are you a Christian? Yeah. Are you a Christian? Yeah. I said, what has Christ forgiven you? And they hang their heads. Well, he's God. He can, he can forgive. Well, we're told to forgive just as God forgives. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. God's not going to ask you to do something that you are incapable of doing. There should be nothing that we hold against somebody else. There should be nothing that I cannot forgive because God has forgiven me everything. And we're given pictures in the Bible of how God forgives us because some people believe that forgiveness is just saying, well, it's okay and, and just kind of being mad for a while and time takes care of it. Or some people think that, you know, forgiveness is, is, uh, is just um, letting somebody off the hook and things. No, it's God says that forgiveness... He speaks of it in word pictures. It's like he puts our sins in the deepest part of the ocean. Okay. He's removed our sins and placed them in the depths of the sea, the Bible says. It used to be that the deepest part of the ocean was the Marianas Trench. I was told that you could put Mount Everest in the Marianas Trench and there'd still be a mile of water above Mount Everest. That's a deep place. I think since then they found deeper places. But the fact is, is there, there's not some kind of sin box down in the Marianas Trench or something where God puts our sins, okay? But that place is a totally inaccessible spot to me. I cannot go there and dredge something up if it's in the deepest part of the sea. Okay. And yet, why do we hold grudges? Because we keep them close to ourselves. We don't put them in the deepest part of the ocean where God puts my sins. No, no, we hold on to them. We put them in a little box next to us. And so whenever somebody... Uh, we need to be reminded about what they've done to us. We pull it out and we shake it in their face and we say, I don't forgive you for this. We hold it against them. God says he puts our sins behind his back. That means whichever way God turns, okay, he doesn't see it. God also says that he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. If you go uh, and let your mind play with that, you'll be going in literal circles, it's a place where God cannot ever catch up with our sins as far as the east is from the west. Are you forgiving people like God has forgiven you? Because that's what we're commanded to do. This is a compassionate thing to do. 
And I know this, that if you've been hurt by somebody, it is hard to forgive sometimes. I get it. Okay, I really do. But we're commanded to forgive them. We're commanded to be kind in that way. We're commanded to show compassion. Okay. The gentle reply is to forgive as we've been forgiven. Okay. This word forgive means to grant as a favor, to pardon as an act of kindness. You don't have to, but you do it anyways because you've been forgiven so much. Not because they even deserve it, but because it's the kind thing to do. You know, Paul did this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 6. Let me show you this real quick. I think this is incredible because Paul is listing out everything that he's been through. Okay? He says in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 6, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee or helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And he says in verse 3, Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And he lists out how they've been doing that, giving no offense, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, that's being beat, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. And he says this, how have we gotten through that in verse 6? By pureness, by knowledge by long-suffering, and then he says, by kindness. By kindness. Same Greek word. Paul exhibited this in his life. He said, it doesn't matter who has hurt me. It doesn't matter what they've done to me. We've gotten through it by being kind. Paul knew what it was to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit of gentleness in his life. This, at this moment, we would normally have a time of invitation. I'd normally ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I'd ask you some questions. But I want you to, right there in your home, think about the fact that God has given to us his goodness. God has shown us kindness. And if you're not saved today, you are despising the lavish goodness that he has bestowed upon you. Why don't you come to Jesus Christ today, realizing that his goodness leads you to repentance? He's given you time and time and time again to repent. If you stand before God one day, and he's going to condemn you to an eternity in hell, you're not going to be able to stand there and say, well, God, you weren't good to me. You never let me have a chance because he gave you chance after chance after chance. We would love to talk with you. And call the church office. You can email us and let us know that you would want to know more about how to become a Christian. But if you are a Christian today, if you're a Christian and you have these obstacles, these barriers to kindness in your life, you need to repent of that. Repent of those things and let your heart be employed in kindness every single day. Be gentle, be courteous in your dealings with others. Be compassionate by forgiving them because this is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Make that decision wherever you're at today. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. I thank you for the reminder that we've had today of the fruit of the Spirit of gentleness, kindness, and goodness. And Father, I pray that your will would be accomplished in each life. If there's somebody out there that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that they would be saved today. And Father, for Christians that are struggling with this fruit of the Spirit in their life, Lord, may we repent of that. Get it right with you. Get it right with others. And Father, that you would make us indeed kind every single day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.